Welcome to another uh, Saturday Physics for Everyone. You guys are troopers for coming to a talk on topological materials and missing the kickoff of the Michigan-Illinois game. But, um, well, I, I went to Northwestern for undergrad, so my, my allegiances might be in a slightly different place. But anyway, um, I'm sure there'll be still uh, some of the football game left after this talk is done. Um, so, um, I am going to hand the mic over to Professor Paul Quiat, who's going to give a uh, quick plug for another physics adjacent thing that's going on in town, and then he'll introduce today's speaker, Professor Bryce Gadway. Cool. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, how many of you have heard about LabEscape? Well, good, so a lot of hands, great, but not everyone, so that's a, that's a bad thing. So LabEscape is an outreach project that we've been putting on for about the last three years. It's a, it's a science-based escape room, uh, which is, takes place at Lincoln Square Mall, just exactly one mile uh, east of here. Uh, we've been running for, as I say, about three years. We've had about 6,000 people go through. We had an article in the New York Times because we are the world's only science-based escape room, uh, as far as I know. And uh, it's super fun, uh, great recreational activity for you know groups of four to six people. But we are only going to be there until basically through the end of this year, through through January. 10th of 2019. So if that's something you're interested in, there's a, a flyers up there and there's a sign up sheet. If you give me your email, I'll send you a discount code for 20% off. We're already the cheapest game, cheapest escape room anywhere because we're a nonprofit, but then it becomes even more so. So anyway, we, hopefully you can uh, come check us out. It's super fun. You don't need to know any science at all to do it. The record time for one of our rooms was by a group of high school students. Another one was by a French teacher and his family with no uh, high school French teacher with no uh, science background at all. Okay. But because you're here to learn about science, I'm really happy to be able to introduce my colleague, uh, Bryce Gadway, uh, who is going to tell us all about uh, making new types of materials, basically. So normally we're stuck with just the matter that we have looking around us, but uh, he and others have been investigating how we can simulate and basically cr fabricate and understand new types of materials uh, using these ultra, ultra cool, both literally and figuratively, uh, experiments. So I'm happy to turn this over to Bryce Gadway. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot, Paul, and thanks, Yoni. Um, so I was really happy to get the invitation to, to speak at one of these Saturday Physics for Everyone's. I used to be a, one of the co-organizers, and now it's nice to see it from the other side. Um, and Paul was right. I'll, I'll talk about um, how do we maybe make in the lab new types of materials to learn some basic science, um, things that are inspired by electronic materials, and then maybe have some neat functionality on their own um, if used for things like light uh, and, and acoustic waves. So this could mean fake, like artificial pearls. Uh, this is mostly like engineered uh, to have some new functionality or to maybe be something that doesn't exist in nature, like, like Paul mentioned. Uh, so here's a picture from my lab. If you go up to the third floor, um, and I can show people this if they want afterwards, um, we make fake or <laughs> engineered systems out of atoms and molecules to study uh, topological physics, and we also have a little experiment down the hall on things like masses coupled with springs uh, to study that, that type of physics. So I'll tell you a little bit about, about uh, how topology, and I'll explain what that actually means, can be explored both in quantum mechanical systems um, and in classical, very classical systems that you would maybe play with in your everyday life. And so artificial, we've defined materials, I think people know what that is, and so I'll try to define what topology or topological means in this context. So what is uh, topology? Um, from mathematics or geometry, um, it means sort of describing how the properties of geometrical objects are affected by, by small, continuous deformations. Uh, so one example would be talking about the genus of an object. So this is just a, a mathematical definition, which basically relates to how many holes piece, uh, pierce the surface of an object. So here are three different objects with different, uh, uh, labeled by a different genus. So I have something like a, like a sphere that has no holes through it, something like a donut, uh, or a bagel that has uh, one hole through it, and uh, a weird pretzel that's missing this little hole in the bottom but has two holes in it. Um, so they have genus 0, 1, and 2, just labeling the number of holes through the surfaces. And if I'm relating this to, to how the, the properties change by small continuous deformations, where I mean I'm not cutting it in half, I'm not piercing it with a knife, then this property, this, this genus, or sort of topological properties in general, 
are robust to small continuous changes. So I can't go from a, this uh, give a cinnamon roll uh, to a bagel without doing something like eating a hole through the center. Uh, I can't just pull it apart. So here's an example of something with genus one. It's a coffee cup, just like the one I have up, up here. Um, and some bad things might happen if I make small continuous changes. I might spill my coffee, but I'm still going to preserve this, the genus of this object. So it's still going to have only one hole through it if I'm just sort of stretching it like it was made of clay. And there's some other nice kind of corollaries with this. If I imagine covering one of these objects with, with hair, so I wouldn't want to eat a hairy donut, but I, it might be fun for just sort of uh, uh, mental exercises. You could actually imagine brushing this all the way around and never having any kind of weird cow licks encountered uh, if you have a hole through your surface. But if you've tried doing this on your children's hair, you eventually have one of these whorls or something where either the hair has to all come together or it all has to basically uh, have a source of hair uh, leaving it. And so I'll, I'll try to tell you a little bit more about topological order and how it's different from the normal kind of order we, we talk about in matter. Uh, so basically, the, the, one of the key distinguishing features is that you can't tell what's going on in a system from local measurements alone. So if we had some, some experimentalist here uh, sitting on some, in some environment, and they wanted to know something about the topology of that environment, uh, they wouldn't be able to tell just from looking at their feet whether they're sitting on something like the Earth or sitting on something like a giant donut. So they'd basically have to traverse the entire surface of the object uh, to, to characterize its topology. So it's related to global system properties. And this ends up making these, these kinds of systems, or at least their, their topological properties, robust to things that happen locally. Uh, so how does this compare with the normal kinds of, of ordered matter we think about? So this is uh, sort of the, the Ginsburg-Landau picture from, from Lev Landau and Vitaly Ginsburg uh, for describing phases of matter. I think about something like, like solid and, and liquid here that I might encounter if I have a, a melting block of ice. Here it's, it's local properties, some local order uh, that I can look at to tell me which phase I'm in. So I can go in and look at the liquid part and I see that my molecules are sort of randomly oriented and there's no regular spacing between them and that would tell me I'm either in the, the liquid or gas phase of this phase diagram and they're basically one big phase that I can go back and forth through. And if I look in the solid chunk, I'll see that I have some well-defined crystal order that tells me I'm in a solid phase. And the same thing is true for, for magnets that we find on our, on our fridge. If I have something like a ferromagnet, I can go in locally and, and look at the orientation. If I had a really powerful microscope, maybe the orientation of my electron spins and see by their orientation uh, what, what state they're in. And even if I had a different magnetic domain that was pointed this way, um, I'd be able to characterize it locally independent of what was going on in the rest of the magnet. Um, and so I'll, topology actually means a lot of things. Even in physics, it, it has a lot of different connotations. So I'll briefly mention a couple places where maybe you've, you've heard the word uh, before. So topological defects are something that people study in a lot of different areas of physics. Um, they can be created on their own in a system by pumping in a little bit of energy, or they can show up naturally if you cool suddenly through a phase transition. So the, uh, here's an example of a, a liquid crystal that was uh, the kind of thing one would use in a, in a LC, LCD projector or an LCD screen uh, that was rapidly uh, passed through a phase transition. And all these little points where I see uh, things kind of coming together at a singularity or a point, uh, these are defects. And the same kind of thing here is seen in a, in a magnetic system. Um, these are defects. These are things called vortices. Or you can almost think of them as like little, like little tornadoes that have a hole in the center. But here it's uh, related to magnetic fields uh, in, a, in a superconductor. And this is the same kind of pattern showing up in the kind of gases I study, uh, where this is a, a gas of atoms around a nano Kelvin temperature that was started rotating, and it forms these little vortices uh, in it. And so these are neat on their own, and people actually use them as models to study the early universe. So if people have ever seen these pictures of the cosmic microwave background, uh, 
Uh, we think that as the, the universe cooled following the Big Bang, uh, that this rapid cooling through a, a transition from one phase to another actually led to a lot of the asymmetry in the matter in the universe and allowed for things like the formation of, of galaxies and, and stars. Um, so that's one type of topology. Uh, topological order uh, in the sense of interacting systems is, is a different version of this. It's not something I'm really going to talk about today, but there's, it's probably one of the hottest areas of topological physics, things like the fractional, fractional quantum Hall uh, effect, quantum spin liquids, really funny things that happen at low temperature when you have interacting particles, either interacting electrons or interacting spins. They can form really weird states of matter that people actually don't know much about still. And so here's a, a picture, an artist rendition of what a spin liquid is, just some spins sitting on water. Um, but they, they can have some weird properties. So here it looks like the things that move charge actually carry a fractional amount of electron charge. So even though your system's made of electrons, they can behave like there's something that uh, has some fractional charge. And I won't really be talking about it today, but I'll say that for kids in the audience, uh, this is maybe a, a pipe dream years ago, but there's actually careers in trying to use things like this for, for new technologies. Uh, so there's a big effort by Google, um, IBM, Microsoft, in trying to build computers made out of quantum matter that can surpass what classical computers can do, even the best blue waters supercomputer, uh, we can maybe outdo it with just uh, some, some quantum matter in a single lab. Here's a picture from Microsoft's effort where they're actually trying to use uh, topological qubits. Um, so this word qubit here, this just means a quantum bit. So the kind of thing that's encoded as a zero or one in your, in your digital classical computer. Um, in a quantum system, could maybe be thought of as like zero, uh, and one, where that's, that's a loose way of talking about it, but the fact that a quantum particle can be in a superposition of two different states at the same time, and you don't actually know before measuring which state it's in. So uh, this, this has some, some powerful properties in terms of how quantum systems can behave. Um, and topological qubits uh, have some nice properties. Because they depend on global properties of a system, they're robust against uh, local noise, which is one of the common or most, most uh, serious noise problems in electronic systems, things like patch charges. And so they may be really, really robust. And so if uh, they could get this to work, Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer might be dancing like the rollout of Windows 95. Um, <laughs> It turns out, I don't know if, if people are aware of this, there was a, a leaked white paper. I think uh, Google's gonna have a result soon where they actually said that they had a quantum device that outperformed the best classical computer. So uh, they're, they're maybe not dancing right now because they've been, been outdone, uh, but maybe they'll, they'll win in the long run based on these topological qubits. Okay, and there's people here doing things along this line. So Dale Van Harlingen, who, who many, maybe many of you know from around town, uh, he uses squids or superconducting quantum interference devices to study uh, the physics of, of topological qubits. Okay. Um, and what I'll mostly be talking about is, is topological materials. Um, I'll show a couple of examples from nature, things that show up naturally where uh, maybe some crystal, maybe some molecule has some special states uh, that electrons can occupy, or in these engineered systems, maybe it's sound or or atoms can occupy, and those states themselves have robust properties. So I, I, I wrote a weird word here. If you've taken quantum mechanics before, you'll, you'll know this. Um, if you've taken linear algebra, you may know this. But if you, if you haven't, don't worry about it. These eigenstates are like normal modes. So imagine some musical instrument that has some well-defined length. There may be some resonant frequencies that, at which it will, uh, it will ring. Uh, if I think about this, this spring here, and I keep it fixed at one end and shake my hand on the other end, if I shake my hand at a certain frequency, I can excite a, a normal mode that just kind of goes up and down. So here's a really low frequency. So this is one energy, the lowest energy normal mode. If I shake it a little bit faster, this is the uh, first excited normal mode. It has this, uh, 
this point in the center that almost stays still and then everything's flying around around it at still higher energy. <laughs> Things go wild. Let's see if I can do this. Maybe this is a normal mode. Uh, so we see uh, some different normal modes having different energies. Um, and there are certain points in that system that are fixed. If I want to get some dynamics, something like a, a wave traveling back and forth on the spring, I actually describe that again by a, a superposition of these, these normal modes. So superposition just means kind of adding up different states. So in the quantum bit, it was adding up a zero or a one, where that might be something like a, an electron and a spin up or spin down. Um, you can also get it by just uh, uh, adding up normal modes of a system. Uh, and so what's a, a, a nice example uh, of a system that, that has these nice properties? So this is a, a, a buzzword you might have heard, topological insulators. If we get rid of the word topological at first, it's something that's electrically insulating, meaning that there's an energy gap between where your electrons would like to be and where your electrons could possibly be. So for things like semiconductors, this energy gap is small compared to room temperature, so we end up having some electrons here that can flow current. If I cool a semiconductor down to, to really low temperatures, it, it acts like an insulator, it acts like something like salt that doesn't conduct electricity, and that's because my, uh, my energy of my system kind of sits here between these occupied states and unoccupied states. But I can have certain systems that have other funny states that appear, other funny normal modes that appear that actually traverse this gap, that sort of live in this area where an insulator would normally not conduct electricity. And in this case that I've shown here, these are states that are going to actually live at the edge of the system. So this would be some, some crystal that's insulating in its bulk, but allows for charge to be carried on its, on its boundary. So one kind of famous example is uh, something known as an integer quantum Hall material. Integer just meaning kind of number, like one, two, three. Hall like the, the Hall effect. Um, and so in its bulk, it looks like this. It's full of charged electrons, and in a really large magnetic field, instead of just kind of flying through or drifting around like they would normally do uh, in a metal, they end up just spinning around in circles in little cyclotron orbits. This is what charged objects will do in a magnetic field. Uh, and here it's kind of so tight that they, they just don't really go anywhere. Um, but if you have a boundary, let's imagine I put the boundary here, one of these orbits will not just continue to go around in a circle, but it'll hit the boundary, reflect, and kind of propagate in one direction on the boundary of the system. Um, so that was one of the first kinds of topological systems that people encountered back in the 80s as, as a pretty big surprise. And so what are some reasons to want to study topology? There are some basic kind of fundamental physics reasons, in particular for those, those funny interacting systems that I talked about, fractional quantum Hall systems and quantum spin liquids there's just a lot that people don't know, and so there's a lot of rich physics. Um, even for these, these topological materials that have interesting states, uh, it's kind of a zoo, and people are just kind of figuring out now how many possible topological materials they are. Barry Bradlin, a faculty member here, uh, helped build a database that characterizes or helps predict what any kind of material will be in terms of its topological properties. Um, but then other faculty members like Taylor Hughes uh, uh, said that there's even higher order types of topological systems that uh, weren't thought of before. So there's still a lot of kind of new uh, basic physics to be worked out. Um, and sometimes we do things just for the pure joy of it. So there's also really interesting mathematical properties of these systems. Um, in particular, they're, they're, they were the first and maybe one of the only examples of a what's known as a fractal in a quantum system. So a fractal is something that we see a lot in nature. Um, it's a, a structure or a pattern that repeats kind of self-similarly on many different length scales. So if I look at, say, the feet of a gecko, 
or, or, or some plant like a fern or this one here, uh, if I zoomed in at different scales, at different magnifications, I would see things that basically look exactly the same and with the same um, general shapes. Uh, one of the earliest examples was people talking about the coastline of Britain, where you see some sort of large filaments here, and if I zoom in again, I see some smaller filaments here, and if I zoomed in on that, I'd see some even smaller ones as well. Um, I love fractals because it lets me teach my daughter about physics. Uh, it's the one thing that connects to something she actually likes. Uh, frozen, and uh, we're all looking forward for another month for, for Frozen 2. Um, and, and in these uh, quantum hall systems, uh, this was definitely the first example of how fractals show up in quantum mechanics. So this was a, a plot here of energy as a function of effectively mag magnetic field um, uh, for a, an integer quantum hall system. So it's a the gas of electrons living in a, in a 2D plane with a magnetic field piercing it. And there's this beautiful kind of butterfly-like pattern or fractal pattern uh, that shows up where uh, it can go from being something like a metal to being an insulator. And, and in these little uh, gaps here are where those, those edge states that I showed before would live. Um, and then there are just uh, practical reasons to want to do this. So I mentioned Microsoft has poured like a billion dollars into trying to build a topological computer, a uh, quantum computer, so um, you can have a career in this and do really well. Um, and then even for more simple purposes, uh, you can just get new functionality out of, out of these robust system properties. So one thing that people are thinking about and that there was a lot of excitement about about a decade ago um, was to try to make uh, something called a, a quantum spin hall insulator that works at room temperature. And what that would allow us to do is maybe build new kinds of electronics that aren't based on charge, but are based on spin. Uh, spin is a property that electrons have. Um, they can either have spin up or spin down. And uh, it's a weird thing that doesn't really have a good classical analog, so I'm not going to try to talk about spinning basketballs. But uh, uh, what it would mean is that you could have uh, uh, spin current flow with almost no dissipation. So that was the big excitement, um, and so there's still progress there. They can be used for making really fast cameras, really fast detectors, and for other kind of technical things. Um, and uh, so they could work at room temperature, and what the kind of the big difference between these quantum hall systems, so we have something that has these edge states already, uh, but there's one bad thing. They require magnetic fields that are sort of almost impossible to make in normal labs, one has to go down to Tallahassee to the High Magnetic Field Laboratory uh, to create magnetic fields that are uh, thousands of Gauss or, or multiple Tesla. Um, uh, so, so one thing that's maybe impacting everybody's life, probably not yet, but maybe down the road, um, a uh, characterization of resistance that's based on the quantum Hall effect is now being used in SI standards. So this is Klaus von Klitzing. He won the Nobel Prize for discovering the quantum Hall effect. He, he, he came to uh, campus last year or so and was championing the use of the quantum Hall effect as a SI standard. Um, the basic idea is that here it's showing something like the Hall resistance, which as one tunes the magnetic field, it doesn't just, it doesn't just change by any kind of pattern, but it actually takes abrupt steps. And that's because every time a new one of these special states shows up, the conductance increases by an integer amount. So it's scaled just by the electron charge squared divided by another constant. This is Planck's constant. And then this number n is, as far as anyone knows, it's just an integer to the sub part per billion level. So this is amazing to find in an actual material that things are that robust when there's all kinds of dirt and defects in a material. And so now it's actually used to redefine the kilogram in combination with some other measurements. And that's good because we don't have to go to France and take off these two little uh, glass cases every time you want to compare some mass you have to this, to this uh, block of mass in, in France. Um, and then not even thinking about electrons, but thinking about systems that have topology based on other kinds of uh, things like light or sound. Um, there's a lot of interest in making uh, things like integrated circuits, but for light, because light travels uh, uh, 
really fast. It doesn't use that much, much energy. We use it already in fiber networks, and uh, it's being used at the chip scale. Um, but there's a key component that's missing, signal isolation. And right now, the way that they do that for light is they have it pass through a crystal that's embedded in an extremely large magnetic field. And there's an effect called the Faraday effect that uh, can kind of keep the light from coming back. And so it allows one to isolate optical signals. It's hard to get those on a chip scale. When I go into my lab, if I'm around one of these isolators, my, my watch will stick to it. So it's, uh, it's really impossible to, to miniaturize and, and put on a chip. But there's, there's other ways to, to get that kind of isolation by creating things that look like a quantum Hall system for light. Uh, so Keji Fang and Gaurav Ball are faculty here in different departments, EC and MEXC, who are actually doing these kinds of things at optical frequencies and microwave frequencies, building isolators. And then uh, other faculty in the College of Engineering, so, uh, so Katie Matlack is trying to do the same thing for uh, acoustics, like sound and energy transport, where maybe it's not for isolation, but maybe it's trying to build better acoustics for Cranert or trying to control where energy goes in some system uh, uh, so it's going where you want it and not spreading all around. So there's a lot of practical applications. Uh, in my lab, we use um, mostly ultra-cold atoms, so really, really cold. Um, when you get them down really cold, they behave like waves and not just like atoms. Quantum mechanics tells us that they behave like waves as well. Um, and then they are still quantum, so they allow us maybe eventually to study things like the fractional quantum Hall effect in a system that's not made of electronic matter and allows for different kinds of probing and different kinds of control techniques. Question. Yeah. How many Kelvin? Okay, uh, so the question was how many Kelvin do we get our atoms down to? Um, I typically don't measure below a certain point, but we're below 100 nano Kelvin. That's cold. There's, there's, there's no kind of, um, there's no cryostat or anything that can get you that cold. It's a special technique that I'll talk about that was developed back in the 60s and 70s to make better clocks. And luckily, some really smart physicists found that if you shot a laser like this at atoms, you could actually cool them down. Um, uh, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it, it can work if you play some nice tricks. So. Yeah, I'll mention what is a quantum gas, and then for our case, for heavy atoms, what do we have to do to actually make them behave quantum mechanically? So normally, you might think of something like gas, so say all the nitrogen molecules in this room, as a bunch of little point-like particles just flying around and bouncing off stuff. That's not a bad description at room temperature. So here, I've labeled some things. I have momentum, some typical momentum. In, in this room, most of these molecules are flying around at hundreds of meters per second for their velocity. Uh, and some typical spacing. So that's going to be related to the density. But quantum mechanics tells us that they should also, on some scale, look like waves, which means that I have some uncertainty about where they are in space. And so, um, this is motivated by something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It says that I can't know the momentum and position of an object simultaneously. Or in general, if there, if there are two properties that don't jive with each other, I can't know them both infinitely well at the same time. And so if I know something about the momentum of my gas, like I know I'm at room temperature, so I probably don't have atoms flying around at a million meters per second. So delta P is not infinitely large, it means that then my, my uncertainty in size has to not be zero. It has to be some, have some size to it. And uh, the system will start, start behaving quantum mechanically when the spacing between these particles gets to be of order this uncertainty in, in where the particles are. So you can think about these waves kind of overlapping. And at that point, some, something quantum about the system is going to become important. And the size of the particles, this actually gets bigger as you get colder. So as my spread and momentum gets smaller, as I cool the system down, this delta x, or the size of the, of, the, of the wave packets here, gets bigger and bigger. And so I, I kind of covered it here, but matter can behave quantum mechanically 
at high density, at low temperatures, or sort of any kind of combination of those two. And so there's a lot of quantum stuff in the universe. Neutron stars, which are not cold at all, but they're incredibly dense, they behave quantum mechanically. Uh, electrons and a piece of copper, they behave quantum mechanically. So they're really light, they're pretty dense, um, and they behave like that. And for, for our case, in my laboratory, we use atoms, which are at least around like 1,000, maybe 10,000 times heavier than electron. Uh, it turns out that this, this makes the game a little bit harder. We have to work to get down to these, these 100 nanokelvin or lower temperatures before they start to act quantum mechanically. Um, and, and this is also partly because we have to work at really low densities, so they're actually about a, a million times less dense than air. So I say, you know, materials, these are not any kind of material you would normally use for any purpose. They're like a little puff of ultra dilute gas, less dilute than the air in front of me. Um, and the reason we do that is because they actually want to form something like a metal. For most of the atoms we use, their ground state is a metal. So if we get them cold and they're at normal density, they'll just make a metal, so we keep them really, really dilute. That's a trick of the trade. Uh, this is how it looks in my lab. We keep them in a vacuum system so there's no other stuff to, to, to collide with them and heat them up above this 100 nanokelvin. Uh, we use one of these tricks where we shoot lasers at them from all directions. And in, in some labs where maybe people are studying something like uh, laser-based fusion, this might impart a lot of energy to the, to the system. Here it's actually taking energy away and it cools them down. It's got a term optical molasses and it really looks like molasses where it's a viscous force that slows down their kinetic motion. Uh, here we, for technical reasons, we shoot them somewhere else. So we actually send in a laser and just shoot them. Uh, we catch them over here and then cool them down to a few microkelvin, which is about a thousand nanokelvin or about uh, a million times less than one kelvin. And, uh, So what does this laser cooling look like? I think about it this way. Imagine there's some speeding train coming at you or a speeding car. It's like trying to throw ping pong balls or tennis balls at it. This is like trying to throw particles of light or photons at an atom. An atom is really heavy and at, at room temperature it carries a lot of momentum. Light carries momentum too. Um, but each little piece of light doesn't carry a lot. So you have to hit it with thousands of photons to bring it to rest from room temperature. Um, and then there's kind of a limit, so we, we have to play some tricks to cool further. Um, and we do what my coffee is doing right now, so we actually just do evaporative cooling. It's also what your body does uh, through sweat. That's why dogs get so hot on a, on a warm day, because uh, they can't do the really efficient evaporative cooling that, that we do. Uh, so we basically let the hottest particles leave, and the rest of it cools down. And just like in your coffee, it's very efficient. When it gets cold, you don't lose half your cup of coffee. The, the ones that leave take away tons of energy. And so here's a picture of what our cloud looks like. This is an image cast by the atoms when we send in light that will excite them to some different state. They, they absorb light and cast a shadow. Uh, we get rid of some and they get a lot smaller because they have less energy in the trap and they look like this little speck. And if we let them go and take a picture of their velocity, we see uh, some, some characteristic peak here. It's a big spike at zero velocity that says that we've uh, created something neat. This is something called a Bose-Einstein condensate. So it's some different phase of matter that bosons can make when you cool them down really cold. It's kind of like a laser for atoms. Um, and then we make materials out of them. So you can make materials for atoms by uh, actually using lasers again. Um, if people have heard how in biological systems, they can go in and grab things like glass beads or polystyrene beads and move them around with lasers. Those techniques were actually developed for, for atoms first, where you can grab atoms with laser light um, because it acts like a, like a potential for them. It acts like something that can push them or pull them. And so if you, if you interfere lasers, you can actually create something that looks just like a crystal, but instead of being made out of a bunch of ions, the kind of way that, that uh, normal solid crystals are. Here it's made out of just laser light. Um, and uh, I, I won't go into a lot of details, but I'll say that in my lab, we actually uh, 
make things that look like lattices in a different way where we actually uh, couple different states of particles. And there's one nice thing that comes out of this. If you have something like a lattice here, what you find is that uh, the coupling between the sites um, has certain restrictions. It has to be real valued. Uh, and the coupling is kind of the same all over the system. Uh, and, and with this kind of control, we can actually make coupling terms that are complex. And I'll kind of tell you what that means in a second. So this is a very technical thing. We shoot lasers at our atoms. They undergo some dynamics, and then we release them, and we take a picture of where they are. So this is my grad student taking a picture with his phone. We actually use cameras, like scientific cameras. Uh, and this is a movie of what happens, kind of a, 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 a bunch of little still images where we create them somewhere, and they sort of spread like waves uh, on the surface of water. So we, we start them somewhere in a system, and they spread out in some wave-like way. And I said that uh, one nice thing about the, the kind of technique I do in my lab is that we have control of something called a, a tunneling phase. Um, and it, it's something that kind of underlies the integer quantum Hall effect that I've been talking about in, the, in this talk. Um, this is uh, something called an interferometer. It takes two possible paths of a particle and, and interferes them. And the kind of pattern you would get out in the end tells you something about what happened in between. Um, so maybe people know about LIGO that, that's detected gravity waves. This is an interferometer where light travels down different paths. And by looking at the resulting pattern of light, when they recombine those paths, you can tell something about what happened along the way. Here, this is like different paths of an electron that come back together. This was a, an old thought experiment back in the 50s where Harnov and Bohm said that if you put in the middle of one of these paths something called a solenoid, which is just a big, uh, um, a bunch of little rings of current uh, kind of going on infinitely high, um, what one finds is that there's actually no magnetic field anywhere along the path of the electrons. But the interference pattern you get at the end, or kind of the pattern at which you detect the electrons, depends on the magnetic field inside the solenoid. So it's a, it's a funny thing. And what it basically says is that the electrons are actually sensitive to how much something called flux, how much electri uh, magnetic flux is enclosed in their path, even if they're not actually interacting with any magnetic fields whatsoever. And it turns out that this, this flux is actually kind of the, the driving force be behind this quantum Hall effect. In, these, in, a, in a solid crystal, one can think about different paths that the electrons take. And the, the flux enclosed by that path, because of this large magnetic field that's, that's uh, being sent in perpendicular to the crystal, uh, that leads to some flux. And that's what causes all this kind of beautiful quantized physics in the, in the integer Hall system. And so we and, and people who use light and use microwaves have a really big problem if we want to study this physics um, in that this is something that happens with charged particles in magnetic field. And I use neutral atoms. Uh, photons don't carry a charge. Uh, microwave li light uh, doesn't carry a charge. Some system of masses on springs doesn't have a charge. So we have to play some little tricks to actually make them behave like they're, uh, like they're charged or like they're sensitive to this flux. And the way we do it is to actually kind of control the, the phase that a particle picks up as it moves somewhere in the system. And so this is what I call the, the tunneling phase. So maybe as it moves between two points in a crystal, it can pick up some additional phase that it, that it wouldn't have had normally. And so these are just some, some stills showing that we can do that in our lab with cold atoms. Um, and now, because this is a bit technical, I'll try to describe some uh, uh, the simplest type of topological material that we can make. This is something that um, uh, doesn't involve this tunneling phase at all. It shows up in a lattice if I just have uh, alternating coupling terms. And so it shows up in nature in a really interesting place. It shows up in molecules like this. This is polyacetylene. Uh, it's an organic molecule. It has this alternating structure of single bonds and double bonds. 
uh, between these, these carbons along the backbone. And it sort of looks like electrons can, can move in the system, but they have a, maybe a different strength of, of moving or tunneling here than they do here. And so this was studied by a lot of physicists. Uh, John Schrieffer, who's, who's famous locally, maybe a little bit more so for the BCS uh, physics, uh, for uh, Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer uh, pairing in superconductors. But he also studied things like this. Um, and what's amazing, what led to the 2000 Nobel Prize in chemistry, is that if you take these molecules and you just sprinkle in a little bit of something else, so not hydrogen, not carbon, but maybe like lithium atoms, so with really light doping, their conductivity jumps up by a factor of a billion. And at low temperatures, they actually behave like superconductors. So it's really weird, and that property is actually tied to something topological about this type of system. And so here it is in kind of a cartoon. We have these, uh, these blue dots are meant to be, in this case, the atoms or the ions where an electron can live. These M's and T's are sort of the strength of coupling between them with electrons flowing back and forth. Um, this is a technical thing, but this is like a plot of energy as a function of momentum in this crystal. If, it's, if these couplings are all equal, I get one continuous energy band at which the particles can occupy. If I have alternating couplings like I do in polyacetylene, I actually open up a gap, just like I have for my the insulator that I showed earlier. So I have this range of energies at which um, electrons can't flow in the system. But if I have a, a finite chain, and instead of having these larger couplings on the ends, if I have them in the middle, what I find is I actually get a little state that lives in this gap, and it's robust to any kind of deformations in the same way that these edge states in the quantum Hall system are robust. And so what happens in polyacetylene is that if I have some chain that actually looks like this, where I have sort of a, a kink in my chain, and I would like to go weak, strong, weak, strong, but now I've introduced some place where I have broken that pattern, I can have a defect that lives there locally, and it can actually move down the chain uh, without any resistance. So this is what happens when they're doped with something other than carbon. It sort of breaks this pattern and leads to um, something called a, a soliton that can move without dissipation. And we can make them in the lab. We can just kind of probe these, these states in the lab. What do they look like? If I have them instead of, of having a, a defect in the middle, if I just sort of um, have an edge to my system, what I find is that this mode that lives in the gap actually is, is localized to the edge. And in the lab, we can make it like this. We can uh, find a nice way of preparing it and image what the wave function, what the, sorry, what the density of our atoms looks like, uh, and it agrees well with simulations. Um, now, I can actually surprisingly do this with tennis balls on strings as well. So, so uh, this is one of these topological material things that doesn't have to be quantum. It just has to have wave-like properties. And so while there's other aspects of the system that rely on the fact that it's quantum mechanical, um, this kind of effect can also be seen with light or sound waves or tennis ball waves on a string. So uh, so I tried to do my best this week to, uh, to make a little demo. Okay, this is a chain of uh, tennis balls. You can think of these as little pendula that are coupled together, where the thing that's moving here, it's not electrons, it's mechanical energy that can move between them, and the rubber bands are, are mediating that transfer of mechanical energy. And I've set it up such that I should have one of these, these localized modes on one edge. And so if I do that here and sort of excite the edge, what I find is that for the most part, the energy stays there, and these ones all the way down the chain don't really do all that much. They're kind of insensitive uh, to what's going on on this edge. Um, but if alternatively, if I excite something in the middle, it's kind of like that set of pictures that I showed earlier where 
I create something locally and it spreads out like a wave on water, energy can transfer to the neighboring ones, to these ones down here, and it can kind of really nicely uh, spread throughout the system. Okay, so now, good, that was worth all my students thinking I was crazy <laughs> using a fish hook to pierce fishing line through tennis balls at, in, last night. Um, <laughs> okay. So, uh, what's one nice thing that we've been able to do in this cold atom system that you can't do in a real material? This is something in collaboration with, with Taylor Hughes's group here, a really great theorist. Um, they had some predictions for what happens when you, when you actually add disorder here. So, it's believed that these systems should be robust, but it's kind of hard to, to test that in any reproducible way with real materials. In our cold atom system, we can sort of turn a knob in the lab and actually just control disorder at will. Um, and what's expected to happen is that as you really crank up disorder, you can drive it from being topological to being some, some trivial insulator. So you can get rid of these special states. This is sort of like a transition you would imagine between like solid and gas, except here it's this, it's this topological property that's changing as you, as you change some parameter of your system. And we were able to measure this, that it actually stays quantized at some integer value over a really big range of disorder here at one, this, uh, this thing that we measure at the topological index, and then it dives down and goes to zero as we really crank on the disorder. And funny enough, this is something we weren't expecting, but the theory actually predicted that in some regimes, if we add disorder, we can actually go from trivial to topological. So this was not something we set out to, to see, but in talking with Taylor and his students, we sort of looked at their predicted graph here and said, ah, oh, that's really weird. Uh, and lucky enough, we were able to measure it and see that this, this index as well sort of rose with disorder when we were in this regime. So this is the first uh, discovery of something called a, a topological Anderson insulator. Okay, so now in the remaining couple minutes, five minutes, I'll just briefly say that like in this topological tennis ball pendulum thing, uh, a lot of aspects of topology can be studied in perfectly classical systems. Um, and it's also nice, it means we can harness their, their robustness in classical systems as well. So it's not confined to the laboratory, but we can use it for practical purposes like having good energy transport or good acoustics. Um, so here's a really beautiful experiment with a bunch of coupled pendula from, from Zurich, um, where they make something called a quantum spin hall insulator but out of just pendula coupled with springs, and uh, should play now. So here they're kind of injecting energy here on the edge, and this is a system where, if you look here in the bulk of the system, not, these pendula aren't really moving around, and the excitation which they highlight in blue is confined to travel along the edge of the system, just like in that integer quantum Hall effect. And uh, maybe an even cooler example that kids will appreciate, uh, Camilla Prodan came and gave a colloquium last year. You can do the same thing with fidget spinners if you attach little magnets to the end. Uh, and she, she set up something that looks like graphene or like a, like a, like a bee honeycomb-like lattice and has some interesting states that you can also reveal just by shaking these fidget spinners. And you see that energy doesn't go into the bulk of the system. And so one thing that we've been trying to do, and I'll just mention this in the last minute, is that in these classical systems, uh, you sort of, you're, you're a little bit limited in that you can't study anything quantum mechanical, but you can take advantage of that and sort of um, say that because my system's classical, I can actually use measurement to my advantage. So normally in a quantum system, if I look at it, I disturb it at a really fundamental level my measurement does something like collapse a wave function into either zero or one, or one state or another, but if it's classical, it doesn't really affect it at all. So I could, I could imagine setting up some system where instead of having them coupled by real springs, which have some limitations, and in particular, they can't have any complex uh, tunneling, just because of how springs work, um, I can imagine something else where I actually measure where my masses are and apply forces as if there were a spring, um, and that can enable me to do things like create something like an artificial magnetic field for mechanical systems. 
So this is a system we've been setting up with some really great undergrads here and with the help of some grad students as well. So Riddy's in the audience, she's been doing a great job. Uh, where the system looks like a, a magnet embedded on a mechanical oscillator and it's driven by some uh, gradient solenoids that give it a little kick. And what's driving that kick is actually the position of a completely different oscillator that sits somewhere else entirely and is monitored by a laser. And then we just measure with those lasers where things are. And so it's a nice kind of programming thing. We, we measure things in Raspberry Pi and then drive some currents. Uh, for some reason, I couldn't get this to be fixed at the last moment, but the video turned sideways. This is one of these masses going up and down. This is the data coming in on a scope of where these masses are. And we're hoping in the next few weeks to sort of couple these up into something that looks like a quantum hall system for masses on springs. Okay, so uh, to summarize, um, topology is a, is a neat mathematical concept that has actually had a, a practical influence on how we think about material systems, that the phase of electrons can have a, a big impact on their dynamics and how they move in materials. Um, it's, it's led to kind of the development of new types of materials with new functionalities. Uh, and this, this interest and all this excitement has kind of spread outside of electronics into things that people do all across the college here. So acoustic systems, optical systems, uh, cold atom systems and cold molecule systems that we study here. Um, and there's kind of nice synergy and, and uh, exchange of ideas between the different communities. And uh, with that, I'll leave it and thank all the students who contribute and thank you for your time. Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you want me to pass that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I gather uh, you have borrowed some uh, useful terminology from, from mathematics, but that the actual uh, subject of mathematical topology, such as algebraic topology, uh, really is mostly irrelevant to what you're doing. Is that the case? So yes, that's the case. Uh, there are people who um, study actual topological excitations in these systems um, that are more closely linked to algebraic topology. So people create things, some excitations called skermions. They create things that um, look like monopoles. So sort of fictitious particles that were postulated in actual particle physics but were never detected, magnetic monopoles. And they can create something that looks like that inside one of these ultra cold gases. It looks like sort of a, a, a source of magnetic charge. And it has some really interesting properties in terms of uh, the topology of the, the fluid around it. And similar kinds of things are even studied in light. If you take laser light and send it through some corrugated piece of glass, when it goes on, it develops all these little vortices. These are places where it's going to look dark. It's sort of like the pattern you see on the bottom of a pool. If you see sunlight passing through and it goes through all the all the water waves that cause uh, uh, some interference of the pattern, uh, that has some, some nice kind of, I'd say, defects that have some interesting topology. That's a really great question. So uh, the way we use the word quantum has changed a lot over the last century. And there are some things that electrons do that are really fundamental in modern day electronics that came about from band theory and really just relied on the fact that electrons behave like waves. And if you're sitting there in like the early 1900s, that's a pretty crazy fact that you can make electrons behave like waves. Uh, that matter can behave like a wave, but that's actually not a very quantum mechanical thing. Um, and so if there's some property, and this is what the, relies a lot of these topological materials, that's just a wave phenomena, 
that it, would, it can show up in any wave-like system. So it can show up for light. You can imagine some system of coupled oscillators, and that doesn't rely on quantum mechanics one bit. Um, there are other things, like this, this billion-dollar investment from Microsoft in, in topological qubits. That relies on topology, but it also relies on this, this funny quantum mechanical thing called entanglement, uh, which is like a fundamentally thing that can only happen for, for quantum particles and wouldn't happen in the classical world. So entanglement means that I uh, take two parts of a system, I give one to Yoni, he runs away faster than the speed of light, <laughs> and I run over here, and we measure them, and what we find is that the measurement outcomes are correlated even though there's no way that we talk to each other or influence each other whatsoever. That there was some, some connection between them, and that's why Schrodinger gave it the name entanglement, um, uh, that leads to some correlations of, of uh, measured quantum observables. More questions? Yes. Oh, that's really interesting. So, if I could make my cold atoms operate at room temperature, I would be a very thankful person. I'd save a lot of money on lasers and other cooling technologies. And in the materials side, people want to get to room temperature as a, as a place of operation. That, that's an interesting question. Is there a good, fun, like practical motivation to actually have things that operate at higher temperatures? I think for a lot of the functionality, the answer is maybe no. But uh, I, I could imagine some sort of niche things where they want it to operate in sort of more uh, flexible environments. So maybe in, in space where things are getting a lot of uh, sun and, uh, and, and you don't have simple uh, heat management. So something that can be robust against heating up. But if we get a lot of these uh, uh, technologies to room temperature, that's kind of a sweet spot where things become viable. Same thing with high TC superconductivity, spintronics, all these, all these things that are sort of promised to be the next, next wave of technologies that will transform our lives, but they're still stuck at uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures. It may be, it may, it depends on the applications so far here are s somewhat technology based. There, there is one application where they can be used as a fast detector of, of light. And so if there was a, an application there that would happen in some environment that's gonna heat up a lot. So maybe even some, some reactor like uh, CERN or something, if, if, if maybe that doesn't heat up. There's not a lot of stuff that collides, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, so I, I don't know offhand. I don't know. I mean, it's hot in some areas and cold in others. But okay. um, actually, I, I had a question. Um, so you talked about topology in terms of like this thing with you know spheres and donuts and stuff. But it seems like a lot of the topological properties you're talking about kind of are topological in some sort of abstract sense. So is there some nice way to connect like like would the system behave differently if you punched a hole in it and you made it look like a donut? Uh, like yeah. Is, is the, topology in physical space ever related to these kind of more abstract topological There properties. is certainly a connection. If I take some system, like a quantum Hall system, and wrap it around a sphere, it has no edges. And it can change a little bit about how the energy states of the system change as a function of some parameter. And it's different than if I put it on a torus or put it on a pretzel, probably, a pretzel with two holes, uh, that, that some properties can change. And that's particularly true in these the ones that are called topologically ordered, that are these weird systems, like fractional quantum Hall systems, that they are some property called the, the ground state degeneracy, which tells you how many ground states you have in your system. That depends exactly on the, the, the space that you're on. So if you cover like a Moibis strip, as opposed to normal 2D land, you might get an extra ground state. And that can have some funny effects. Uh, Professor Gabway for a fantastic talk. Um, you're going to hang out to answer questions for a few minutes? <laughs>
I'll hang around for questions, like I said. Yeah, if you want to, yeah, you'll, you'll be around. down here if you want to ask more questions. And um, thanks again. See you all in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm.